Good evening. It's good to be here with you this evening. Thanks for being here with us. Um, there's some visitors that are here with us, and we've got some, some new faces in the crowd. And so thank, thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate you coming. Um, I lived with Brother Paul DeGarmo, Paul and Kathy, for three months when I moved to Columbus, Ohio. And so um, it's especially nice to see them, as well as Phil and Bonnie from the Columbus area coming out here tonight. Um, if, if truth be told, I left a key to the church building at Paul's house on Sunday night. And so I'm glad that he came tonight because um, he brought that key back to me. So he was seeking the lost key. Yes, kindly entreating and uh, brought it back. And I, I appreciate that as well. <clears throat> uh, I have eaten three meals in the space of eight hours today. And so I am carved up and caffeinated tonight. And um, if I can't fit in my suit by the end of the week, please forgive me. Um, but y'all are feeding me well, and I appreciate, I appreciate that. And um, appreciate your kindness and hospitality in those ways. You know, many people have heard of the Ethiopian eunuch of Acts chapter 8. Many gospel meeting sermons have centered around the conversion of the African treasurer there from Acts chapter 8. I've preached a lot of those sermons myself, and my guess is that some of you have heard sermons like that at some point in time. But did you know that the Bible speaks of another Ethiopian eunuch? And furthermore, I believe that there are some great lessons that we can learn from this Ethiopian eunuch that we probably don't hear very much about, and they're lessons in helping us win the lost and win the erring souls to Christ. You know, today, the goal of our lesson is to train. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30 says this. It says, he who wins souls is wise. We need to be soul winners for Jesus. We need to be, as the songs that we've just sang, we need to be workers for the Lord. We need to be seeking the lost and trying to win them to Jesus Christ. But it takes good wisdom and it takes discretion to be soul winners, whether it be erring brethren or whether it be souls that are far outside of Christ. We need to sharpen our skills and how to communicate with them and to win them so that we can be effective. One of the most beautiful things that's said about Jesus is found in Matthew chapter 12, verses 18 through 21. Take a look there before we get into the text of our evening. Matthew chapter 12, verses 18 through 21. In this passage, in verse 18, it says, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, they're quoting from Isaiah, prophesying about Jesus. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. He will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. Notice verse 20, a bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Now we know that's about Jesus, but what does that phrase mean, a bruised reed he will not break? and smoking flax he will not quench. You know, if you take a look out near ponds, you'll find reeds growing up all over ponds all the time. They're, they're somewhat useless to a degree. They might have made some paper out of them back in first century times, but they're especially useless if they're bruised or broken. And yet something that's said about Jesus is that a bruised reed he will not break. You will not find those that other people have bruised and hurt and injured. He will not find them useless. No, he will find them valuable. Smoking flax, he will not quench. The idea of the smoldering wick or smoking flax. I want to suggest to you that there are some in churches today who are bruised, who are on the verge of flaming out like a smoldering wick. And Jesus wanted to win those people back. That's one of the things that made him different. 
than many of the other religious leaders of his day. Do we? Are we people who want to win back those who have been hurt and are pained and those who are in uh, a mire in their lives? And so we are going to use a fairly unconventional passage to try and learn how we can get better at this, how we can get better at winning the hurt and the broken back. So let's use Jeremiah 38 as our template. Will you turn with me to the book of Jeremiah? Jeremiah chapter 38. Jeremiah, when you study about him, let's, let's just learn a little bit about Jeremiah himself as we set this lesson up for a moment. But the background of Jeremiah's work is this. Jeremiah is popularly called the weeping prophet. He's called the weeping prophet because he's prophesying to people who didn't want to really hear his prophecies. And that's a very sad situation to be in. If you're a prophet and people don't want to hear what you're prophesying about, it's kind of sad to have a job like that, right? If you're a preacher and people don't want to hear what you're preaching, that's kind of a sad situation to be in. You're a teacher and people don't care about what you're teaching. It's kind of a sad situation to be a teacher when nobody wants to listen to what you're teaching. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet, and he's the author of Jeremiah. He's the author of Lamentations. And in that word Lamentations, we have the word lament. It's a the book of great sadness, lamentation. And Jeremiah prophesies about some hard and some necessary topics in order to warn Israel. Jeremiah calls upon Israel to repent. In Jeremiah chapter 3, it's kind of how the book starts out there. Look at Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. It says there, as you kind of walk with me through Jeremiah, just a few phrases here. It says in verse 12, go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, return, backsliding Israel. This is what Jeremiah was supposed to preach. Return, backsliding Israel. You've, you've left. The idea of being backslidden is you're not where you're supposed to be. You've fallen backwards in your faith. And we know that about Israel, that they many times had fallen in their faith. They were, became idolatrous. They became sinful. They were not loyal to God, their father. And so Jeremiah's job was to try to get them to come back. So return backsliding in Israel, says the Lord. I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not remain angry forever. Now, notice verse 13, only acknowledge your iniquity. Jeremiah is saying you need to acknowledge that you've done something wrong here, that you have transgressed against the Lord your God. You've scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree. You have not obeyed my voice. Verse 14 says, return, O backsliding children. So this is Jeremiah's job. His job is to try to get people to come back to God and be loyal to the God who had been so good to Israel in times past and still could be good to Israel if they would just be obedient to him. This is the God who had made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the God after Israel was taken to Egypt. He sent plagues upon Egypt. He then rescued them from an evil Pharaoh who was oppressing them. He allowed them to cross the Red Sea. He'd been so good to them. He fed them with manna and then with quail. He took water from a rock in the wilderness. He empowered them to cross over the Jordan River. He gave them power to conquer Jericho and all the other cities so that they could inherit Canaan's land just as he had promised. God had been so good to Israel. And yet here they were taking God for granted by how they were living. And so Jeremiah's job was to get them back in that right relationship with God. He calls upon them to repent. He warns in Jeremiah 5, 14 through 17, of a coming invasion. It says there that a nation from afar would come and attack Israel. We know who that is in the Bible. It's Babylon. We read about Daniel being a captive in Babylon or Chaldea. They were eventually taken into that Babylonian captivity. And Jeremiah was one of the people who warned about it. He warns in Jeremiah 6 of a destruction that's coming upon Jerusalem. So he's speaking to people in the capital city, saying that this is a city that must be punished. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody was walking around the streets of Barnesville, Barnesville saying this is a city that must be punished, he might not be a very popular fellow. People are saying Washington, D.C., the capital city of the United States of America, is going to be punished. Sometimes that's not a very popular thing to say. 
That's what Jeremiah was saying. And some people didn't like hearing all that negativity and bad news. He prophesies in chapter 25, 11 through 13, that there is going to be 70 years of captivity for their sins. It says, quote, these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And despite all that prophesying, Jeremiah's message was not well received by the proud nation. Take a look at chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, and what you find is that they refused to receive Jeremiah's message. In verse 3, it says, O Lord, are not your eyes on the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. Jeremiah is frustrated. They're not grieving. They're not sorry for their sins. They don't care. My message is falling on deaf ears. They, you have consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces Harder than rock, they have refused to return. That's the situation with Jeremiah. Prophesying to people who didn't want to hear what he had to say. Most importantly, what God had to say. Because ultimately, it's not a rejection of the prophet or just the preacher or just the teacher or just the elder. When someone rejects God's word, it's a rejection of God. They didn't want to hear what God had to say to them through the prophet. You read in chapter 6 and verse 10, as we keep walking through this, verse 10 says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Their ear is uncircumcised. They cannot give heed. The word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. They don't enjoy hearing God's word. They don't enjoy being corrected, so they can walk in God's will. They have no delight in it. Verses 13 through 16 says, from the least of them to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness from the prophet, even to the priest, even the religious leaders were corrupt in verse 13. Everyone deals falsely. This is a situation that Jeremiah is in. They didn't want to hear his message. They ignored the message, in fact, and take a look at Jeremiah chapter 18. They ignored the message and they got angry with the messenger. In Jeremiah 18 and verse 18, they said, come and let us devise plans against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us attack him with the tongue and let us not give heed to any of his words. So they're upset with Jeremiah and they begin to attack him personally. Now, sometimes when we don't like what the preacher is saying or even what our parents are saying or, or, or what the elder might be saying, if it's from God's word, sometimes instead of just having a humble attitude and receiving the word, we start to attack the person who delivered the message to us. The apostle Paul had this experience and he asked Galatians, Galatians 4, 16, he says, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? Because he felt like some were attacking him just because he had tried to share the truth with them. Sometimes we can hate people and Christians who simply are trying to tell us the truth. This is what happened to all the prophets. Jesus even says this has happened from the blood of Abel all the way to the blood of Zechariah. From the first prophet to the last prophet of the Old Testament. He says this has always happened and now it was happening to Jesus when he said that. And it will happen to those who preach Jesus today. Now, at one point in time, not only did they attack Jeremiah with the tongue, though, like what we read in Jeremiah chapter 18, but at one point they threw Jeremiah into a pit because they were so angry. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine some preacher today being up here in the pulpit? Maybe it's me. You didn't like what I had to say tonight. So everybody says, you know what? Let's take Josh. Let's tie him up by a rope. Let's find the deepest pit that we can find in Barnesville. Let's throw him down there. We don't want to hear him the rest of the week. That will get us out of the gospel meeting the rest of the week. Let's just throw him in a pit. That's what they did with Jeremiah. Take a look at chapter 38. We're going to start reading here. In this chapter, here's what happens. Jeremiah warns the people, if they stay in the city, that they are going to die. And that city is Jerusalem. It says in verse 1, Now Shephatiah, the son of Matan, Gadaliah, the son of Pashur, Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, Pashur, the son of Malchai. All those names don't really matter here. But here's what matters. They heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken to all the people. And here's what he said. Verse 2. Jeremiah had said, thus says the Lord, 
He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes over to the Chaldeans shall live. His life shall be as a prize to him. He shall live. So basically, Jeremiah says, I've been telling you that you guys are going to get attacked. I've been telling you that if you don't repent, the time is up. That the capital city of Jerusalem, they're going to build a siege wall around it. There's going to be a siege mound. They're going to come here and you are going to become slaves or you're going to die. And so I'm telling you that time is now that you just go need to go ahead and give yourselves up to the people of Babylon willingly instead of trying to fight this because you can't fight God's will. Take a look at verse three. Thus says the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. He's going to take your city. It's, it's kind of like it, it, we, we saw this actually pretty recently, right? We saw Russian tanks and Russian troops gathering all around the country of Ukraine. And people were saying, it looks like something's about to happen. So, oh, no, no, no. Russia wouldn't do that, would they? That wouldn't happen to us. You know, we're enjoying our freedom, our democracy. Everything is good here. Well, it happened, didn't it? You can be in denial all you want, but they were out, they were out to conquer your, your country. And that's what happened to Jerusalem. Babylon came. Babylon was there. And there's still people in denial. That's no, no, no. This is Jerusalem. This is God's holy city. We're God's people. You can't bring us down. Jeremiah keeps saying, I keep telling you, you're going down. And they did. Well, in verse four, what you learn is the people didn't like that negative news. They didn't want to hear it. And so kind of what we do today, sometimes if we don't want people to hear a certain news source or a certain narrative, we, we block. There's actually countries that can block that. Talk to people in North Korea. They, they block out any type of dissenters who disagree with North Korean government. So you can't hear the other side of the narrative. This happens in China. This happens in other places, too. They'll shut you down if you're presenting an alternative viewpoint to those who are in power. And that's what happens here. Look at verse four. The princess said to the king, let this man be put to death because he weakens the hands of the men of war who remain in the city, the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. This man does not seek the welfare of this people, but their harm. This guy who's preaching bad news, we don't want to hear from him anymore. And so Zedekiah, verse five, who's the king, he says, look, he's in your hand. The king can do nothing against you. If you guys want to shut down Jeremiah, go ahead and shut down Jeremiah. In verse 6, here's what they do. They took Jeremiah. They cast him into the dungeon of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the prison. And they let Jeremiah down with ropes. And in the dungeon, there was no water. There was mire. And Jeremiah sank in the mire. So what they do here is they shut down his Twitter feed. And they throw him in a pit. To try and silence him, right? We don't want to hear from you anymore. We don't want to hear any of your negative talk. We're going to shut you down. So look at the situation here. Jeremiah is in an old muddy well. And he begins to sink in the mud with no way that he can get out on his own. Can I suggest to you, as you look at this picture and you think about it perhaps in a, in a spiritual way. May I suggest that there are a lot of people who are in a similar situation in life. Sometimes we get into an emotional pit of despair and it feels like we can never get out of the downward spiral on our own. There are people that feel very discouraged and it just doesn't seem like they're ever gonna quit feeling discouraged. There are times that we can feel very helpless because we feel like we're in a helpless situation, maybe a helpless marriage, it may be a helpless situation as parents, it may be a helpless situation as kids, maybe a helpless situation in our church, maybe a helpless situation in our community, in our job. But we just get down into the dumps and into a pit and we feel very helpless. I'm going to move that back just a little bit. Sometimes we're in a muddy pit of sin. And we need out of the buyer. 
There are people who get addicted to sin and they get addicted to uh, drugs and alcohol. And they get addicted to pornography and they get addicted to, to various sins. And it just doesn't seem like they can get out of it. They feel stuck. Sometimes, like Jeremiah, we're victims of persecution. Jeremiah, it wasn't a sin situation with him. It was a sin situation for his attackers. And when that happens, the righteous need to speak up for us instead of letting us get trampled upon by evil people. But, you know, the evil people of Israel, they would have just left Jeremiah in the pit to die. No food, struggling to stay above ground. I'm not sure how quickly he was sinking, but has anybody ever sunk in mud? My parents' property used to have a very muddy section of their property. And we had to, we had horses growing up. We had to feed horses. And there were times we had to go out there. There was, I remember one time that we started sinking in the mud and our boots started to get swallowed up by the mud. Have you ever had that? And so somebody had to come rescue us. And then their boots got stuck in the mud. And by the end of it, we're all, our boots are out there in the mud and we're walking back with our socks on. Because it sucked them up. Sometimes life feels like that. And they would have just left Jeremiah there in that situation, in the darkness, defeated. Well, what got him out? Well, that's where the original Ethiopian unit comes into play. Look at verses 7 through 10. Thankfully, someone notices the pit of despair that Jeremiah is in and chooses to find a way to get Jeremiah out of the pit. Verse 7 says this, now ebed Melech, the Ethiopian... One of the eunuchs who was in the king's house heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. And when the king was sitting at the gate of Benjamin, ebed Melik went out of the king's house and spoke to the king, saying, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon. He is likely to die from hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. And then the king commanded Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from here thirty men with you and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. Thankfully, someone notices the pit of despair that Jeremiah is in and chooses to find a way to get Jeremiah out of the pit. What we see happening in verses 7 through 10 is that um, ebed Milet goes and talks to the king about this injustice. I mean, he didn't have the right to just jump down into the pit himself. He couldn't by himself pull him up out. And so he goes and he talks to the person who could give him permission and the rights. And he reasons with him and says, this isn't the right way to be doing things. This isn't the right way to be treating Jeremiah. The rest of you may be evil, but I've still got a good conscience. And I can't in good conscience allow you guys to lead Jeremiah down that pit and to let him starve to death. He deserves better than that. So we need to get him out of here. And the king allows ebed Melech to help with 30 other people. If only we had the heart of ebed Melech when we saw the despair of other people. And it starts with seeing the despair of other people. It starts, if you're going to make changes and help people who are in this mire and in this pit, it starts with just seeing the discouraged Christian. Sometimes it's written all over their face. Sometimes people wear their emotions on their sleeve. It's not that hard to see. Sometimes it's by the fact you don't see them. But when you realize those situations exist, and we need to have the heart of Ebed Melech and say, I haven't seen you for a while, or I see you, but I can see something's not right. What's going on? It starts with someone seeing the grieving widow. This is someone who's lost someone important to them in their lives. And pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this that you visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. 
Pure religion is not just something that happens inside the building. It means sometimes we go outside the building and we help people in their grief. Seeing the despair of others is important for, for when we see the single mom who's trying to raise her child and trying to do so without the support perhaps of a, of a husband in a, in a difficult situation and offering what you can do to help the situation. It's seeing the jobless dad who's in despair because he can't feed his children. He's worried. He's concerned about it. And he doesn't need your pity. He needs your help. What can you do? Seeing that. It's seeing the disabled person, the elderly person who is lonely, just needs a friend. It's seeing the, the, the sinfully destructive who need someone to notice and pull them out of the pit. It's seeing the persecuted brother. We've got to see it to change it and to help it. So don't just notice people in the pit. The thing about Ebed Mila, because he doesn't just notice and walk away, but find ways to help and create a plan to help the situation. What good is it to see the need and to walk away from it? James 4.17 says that sin is this. Sin is when you know to do good and you don't do it. That's the sin of omission. And so often, I think with, with Christians, it's not what we're committing in breaking God's commands. It's what we're omitting, knowing good things we could be doing and not acting on them. Ebed Melech notices, he finds ways to help, and he talks to leaders, and sometimes it involves that. It involves talking to leaders about ways that we might be able to rescue the perishing and we might be able to fight against injustice while showing mercy. And notice that Ebed Melech is allowed to take with him 30 other people. And so, friends, if the situation warrants you taking 30 other people to help, then sometimes that's what it takes. When I was in Kokomo, we had a family who had all converted to Christ. It was, it was two twins, and it was their older sister. Their, their parents never, never converted, but, but they did, and they were all in high school, and parents didn't pay the bills, got evicted every nine months or so, basically, and they were about to get evicted again, and mom had not enough money to pay the rent. They're high school kids. They don't have any money to pay the rent. And one of the most encouraging times I remember from when, from when I was there was, was when we realized that was a situation. We helped them find a new place to live. Individuals helped to donate the money so that they could have a place to stay. They didn't have any furniture. Individuals took their money, bought them bunk beds, bought them mattresses, bought them pillows, bought them other things, and gave them a place to live. I couldn't have done that by myself. I saw it as a preacher. I was the first one to hear about it. I said, this is way too big of a job for Josh to fix by himself. I'm going to need people's help, and these kids need help. And you have no idea how this is going to change how they feel about the church and their family, and they'll see the church as their family if this is what we do to try and help. No money taken out of the church treasury. That wasn't, that wasn't something that happened, but individuals individually helped because they saw the need and they cared about these kids. That kind of stuff happens, honestly, all the time. It happens all the time in the 20 years that I've been preaching. Don't always hear about those good news. We don't always advertise those things. Sometimes we advertise the bad things that happen. But I'll tell you, when we act like Ebed Melech and we see that there's a problem and everybody jumps in to try to be helpers and solutions instead of complainers about it, it'll make a big difference in the church. Well, how did Ebed Melech do it? This is where I really want to get into the heart of the lesson. And that is the, the eunuch used a method and it was two things he used to get Jeremiah out of the pit. It was ropes and it was rags. Look at verse 11. It says, Then Ebed Melech the Ethiopian said to Jeremiah, Please put these old clothes and rags under your armpits, under the ropes. And Jeremiah did so. 
So they pulled Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him out of the dungeon, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Notice what they did there. Ebed Melech used two key resources to rescue Jeremiah. He uses ropes and rags. Now, what's the purpose of the ropes? Well, the ropes were to pull Jeremiah up out of the pit. He must have been too far down to just reach down and grab his hand. And so you got to have something to, for him to put under his armpit so that the people up above the pit can pull him up out of the mud. And if he was down in the mud, then that would have taken a lot of pulling. Because not only do you have, let's just say he's 200 pounds, the Bible doesn't give you that information, but let's just say he's a 200-pound man, and he's a 200-pound man that's deep in the mud, it takes some strong people to pull him up out, right? The ropes, though, what I want you to see, the ropes were accompanied by rags to keep Jeremiah's armpits from being torn to shreds. Can you imagine having some coarse ropes put under your armpits and somebody trying to pull you up? What's, there's going to be some chafing there. There's going to be some blood. It's going to hurt a little bit. And so Ebed Melech has the thoughtfulness to say, I know this is going to hurt, so I'm going to take these rags and these old shirts, and I want you to put them up under the ropes because I don't want you to hurt when we pull you out. There may be a spiritual lesson for us, and it's what I call the R and R principle, not rest and relaxation, ropes and rags. Ropes here. I just want you to think about this in a spiritual way. Ropes may figuratively represent God's word. Let me get you to think about this. We cannot get ourselves or others out of the pit without truth, without God's word. In John 8, verses 31 and 32, you see Jesus saying something here about the, the importance of truth. In the word of God, it says in verse 31, it says, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. What do I have to do to be a disciple of Jesus? I've got to abide in his word. Look at verse 32. You shall know the truth. And what's the truth going to do? The truth is going to make you free. You're in a pit. You're enslaved to sin. You're stuck. What can the truth do for you? The truth of Jesus. It can release you from the slavery of sin, and it can make you free. It can get you out of the pit. So truth is what fixes our spiritual problems. Not opinion, not majority rule, not tradition. Truth is what gets people out of the pit. Now, let me say this. It doesn't really matter why we're in the pit. We need out of it. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 9 and 10 lists a lot of sins there. You know, fornication, adultery, drunkenness, covetousness, thievery, homosexuality, sodomy. All those things are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 6. And they're things that the people of Corinth were committing as sins. And it says, such were some of you. But you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified. These people were forgiven of those sins. Doesn't really matter why we're in the pit. Sometimes we like to argue about that. Well... They wouldn't be in the pit in the first place if they hadn't done that. What good is it debating why somebody's in the pit or how it happened? It happens. Sin happens. And it's our job not to be the explainers away of why it happened, but it's our job to be rescuers of the sinful. My girls just, we had a gospel meeting last Wednesday through Saturday. And so I've, I've been at church like, I don't know, 10 days straight now. I'm not complaining. I love it. But we had the preacher over for dinner last Wednesday who was at our congregation. And so we made, we made dinner and the girls were pouring uh, some tea in his cup right before he sat down. And we have one of those pampered chef pitchers, you know, that you got to open it to the open part. If you have it on the closed part, it all comes out the side. And so my daughter pours tea all over the guy's plate and the seat and he jumps up real quick. And she's kicking herself. She's saying, oh, I'm so dumb. And, and she's mad at herself because she's done it. And her sister's saying, you're so dumb. You know, <laughs> Why did you do that? And I said, can we please quit bickering and clean the man's seat up, okay? Right? I told you I was raised three teenagers, all right? Because really, it doesn't matter why it happened at this point. It happened, so all we can do is just fix the mess now. 
That's all we can do. You can't undo sin. All you can do is learn from it. So truth is what helps us to, to learn what, what sin is and helps us to get out of that pit. Truth is what leads us to repentance. Repentance is a change in direction. Jeremiah was in the pit. Didn't necessarily even matter why. He just needed to go. That's really what repentance is, isn't it? It's when I'm living in sin and I need to go a different direction. Luke 13, verse 3, unless you repent, you will perish. How do I know what to repent of? Well, truth is what teaches me what I need to repent of. And thankfully, I've got a God who in 2 Peter 3, 9 is described as this, that God is not willing that anyone should perish. He doesn't want you to stay in the pit, but he's long-suffering to us because he wants all people to come to repentance. He wants everybody to get out of that pit. We could apply this not only to individuals, but even to churches. Revelation 2, 5, Revelation 3, 4. There were a couple of churches that were in the pit. Sardis, Ephesus. He tells them, you, your old church needs to repent. Jesus told the sinful woman in John 8 and verse 11. He says, I'm not going to condemn you here, but you do need to, to, to go and sin no more. You need to change directions. Well, that's what truth can do. But there's a second thing here. And that is that Jeremiah also needed rags. And rags, I, I think, represents the idea of Ebed Melex, the Ethiopian's compassion. He had compassion. And when the prodigal came home, he wasn't just met with truth by the Father, who represents God in Luke 15. God doesn't just come to the prodigal and say, you know that you were hanging out with harlots and you were wasting money you were being a bad steward that's what the older brother did the one we're not supposed to be like the father just saw him from a long way off and it says that he came and had compassion and he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him and to me that's one of the most beautiful verses in the bible because we've all been that prodigal Maybe some of us, it's been a lot more public and a lot more noticeable than others, but we've all been that prodigal. And we've all needed compassion. Rags are necessary because repentance is hard and compassion comforts. And it was an act of compassion for the Ethiopian to think of how the ropes would hurt Jeremiah, but I want to help soften the blow with rags. We need more Christians who don't just shout truth, but they do it in a way that is gentle and kind. And we need people who shine the light, but if you put that light right in someone's eyes, it might overwhelm and blind them. We need people who share the water of life, but we don't need to make people drink it out of a fire hose. Preach the truth, but don't do it so loudly that it's deafening to those who hear. Do you see what I'm saying? Ropes and rags. And I don't think I'm saying anything unscriptural. And here's why. Keep on walking through some passages with me. We need to be rescuers of those who are wandered from the truth. That's what James 5 says. We just sang about it before the lesson. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth... And someone brings him back. Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is our job. Rescue the perishing. Seek the lost. What was it? the phrase we just sang? Seeking the lost. Yes, kindly entreating. Kindly winning them back. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 20 says, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. So to win someone back, they do need to listen to us. They do need to hear. But we need to apply that ropes and rags principle to our efforts. Let me show you three passages. Galatians 6, 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore. What's it take to restore? It takes truth. That's the ropes. Restore such a one in a spirit 
of gentleness. Both of those things are scripture. Both of those things are necessary. And both of those things will make us more effective in winning people to Christ. Do it in a spirit of gentleness. That's the manner. That's the rags. That's the compassion. Be gentle. Second Timothy 2, 25. This is written to Timothy as a young teacher in humility. That's your attitude. That's your manner. Humility, I like to describe it, it's spelled with a U before I. I'm going to think about you before I think of myself. I'm going to put myself in your shoes, and I'm going to ask myself, how would I like someone to talk to me and to win me back if it were me who was in this situation? In humility, correct those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so they may know the truth. They need the truth, that's the ropes, but they need the rags with it. They need the humility. 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give a defense. That's the truth. I need to know the truth so I can defend what I believe about Jesus, but give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. How do I do it? With meekness, sweet-spiritedness, and with fear. Do it with a meek attitude. Now, I want to tell you something. One without the other will not be nearly as effective. You gotta have both of them. You can't have rags without ropes. You can't have ropes without rags. Let me explain what happens when we have one without the other. Rags without ropes will not help a person get out of the pit. You hear what I'm saying? Compassion without the truth is not gonna help somebody get out of the pit. They need more than just compassion, just sorrow, just care, just tears. They do need truth. Let me give you some examples. Telling somebody, well, I'll pray for you. But they don't just need prayers. They might need instruction. That's not helpful. It's nice of you to say that. It's a pleasantry that we sometimes say. But, you know, somebody has a marriage problem. I'll pray for you. Maybe they need you to teach them. Here's the way that God wants you as a husband, you as a wife. Here's how he wants you to treat. Just walk through them with maybe here's what's breaking down in your marriage. They need the truth. I've seen people with financial problems. And so, well, I'm sorry about that. That's tough. I'll pray for you. Maybe they need somebody to sit down and say, let me show you how to work a budget. Let's think about what we could cut out from our budget and what we need to include or maybe some additional sources of income we could have here. Well, what can we do to help you through the financial problems? You don't really help somebody just keep throwing money if you haven't taught them how to handle their money. Sometimes people don't just need the compassion. They need help. Addictions. I'll pray for you. They might need more than that. They might need some instructions, some help walking through it. Sometimes people need more than prayers and hugs. They need godly teaching to help fix issues. Letting somebody cry on your shoulder out of sorrow for their sins without giving them godly wisdom to get them out of those sins. That's just empty sentimentalism. And some in our culture think that being nice, well, that's the ultimate, uh, that's the ultimate goal. And, and even if that means avoiding truth, um, as long as I'm nice, that's okay. Wrong. We need the sentimentality. We need the love, the compassion, but... You gotta have the truth too. But there's the opposite side of things. Ropes without rags, that's truth without compassion, may get the person out of the pit, but they're gonna be hurting because of the abrasion. Look at a passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. It talks about the man who Paul had written about in the first letter, and this is someone who had repented. And it says, Such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. You should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. And I beg you to reaffirm your love to him. Paul says, you've kicked this guy around enough. I think it's time to show him some love and some affection. You know, sometimes we brag on ourselves, oh, I really told them the truth. You better make sure that you're speaking the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15 says. I'll give you some examples of this as well. I've seen people do this over text messages. Somebody's done something bad. Somebody's, somebody's not been here at church or something like that. So we send them a text message. Well, I let them know that was wrong. 
Can I suggest to you a text message is not the way to handle your criticisms? Matthew 18, do you know what it says? It, it, it says that if you've got a problem with somebody, it doesn't say send them a text. It doesn't even say send them a letter. It says go to them face to face. Have that conversation. Because I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of things that people will say over a text message or a social media feed that they would never say to somebody face to face. Sometimes harder to say. Sometimes we'll send somebody a harsh letter. I've seen a lot of, a lot of bad things happen when we send a harsh letter. We're, maybe we need to have that conversation face to face. I'll tell you a story about myself. When I was a young preacher, a couple years into preaching, we had a young man who um, had some, some alcohol problems. He had already had a couple of uh, DUIs or maybe you call it OWIs. I don't know. But this time he, he, he flipped a car. He tried to run from the car. Cops were chasing him. And then he tried to fight a cop, which is not a good idea. Cop beat him pretty good. So he's in the, the jail, the local jail. And I'll tell you, as a young man, I was, when I started out preaching, I was doing a radio program. I was teaching two Bible classes. I was preaching two sermons, five lessons a week. My first full-time work um, was putting out a bulletin. I was busy and I wasn't happy about having to go to the jail and spend time talking to a kid who was raised in the church, who I thought, well, you know better than this. And I came in there and I came in there with an attitude. Because I was upset and I thought, well, this is probably the best approach, right? So I went in there, I had my Bible in my hand. I said, what am I doing here? You know, this kid, after I looked at him in the eyes, he looked tired. He was bruised. He'd been crying. And I came in there guilt tripping him about something he good and well knew was wrong. He didn't need somebody to guilt trip him right there. He just needed somebody to tell him, I love you. What can I do to help you fix this? But sometimes we can do a lot of hurt. Now I've got some good news, by the way. He was on the Dave Ramsey program a couple of years ago, debt free, um, living a, a great life, married, has a couple of kids. So he's doing a lot of well. He's broke that habit. It's a, it's a, it's a great story. But sometimes when we talk to people with the ropes, without the rags, we can do a lot of harm. And it took some while to build and rebuild that relationship. To simply speak the cold truth without the warmness of brotherly love, affection, and compassion makes us guilty of a cold formalism. Cold hearts can't warm a wounded soul. This can happen in all kinds of ways. This can happen in all kinds of ways. You know, sometimes we, we come to Bible classes a lot and we get used to talking to one another and things like that. And sometimes we can get kind of like caustic with one another and how we talk to one another. Because we sometimes that just means we feel comfortable with one another. But you need to think about what being caustic with somebody else in a Bible class does to the visitor who's maybe there for the first time or the new Christian. It can be discouraging to the people who hear it. Because it feels like you're speaking the truth, but you don't seem to love each other. Let's make sure that we're careful with our tone and our tack. I think people are longing for truth, but I think they want it with kindness as well. So, question for you is, are you using the ropes and rags approach? Think about it. Because we need it. We need the R&R &R approach. We need it in our preaching. Have you ever heard a sermon that was real nice, but it just danced around the truth, never got to the point? Well, we got to have the rags, but we got to have some ropes, too. We've got to tell the truth. Have you ever heard a sermon, though, that was true, but it was so harsh and it was so unfeeling, just left people feeling wounded? We need it in our preaching. We need it in our personal work. Have you ever been the person who's a sweetheart to your friends, but you never tell them what they need to hear because you, you don't want to hurt the friendship? It's great that you're nice to your friends, but sometimes you've got to be willing to have the courage to tell them the truth. Have you ever told somebody what they needed to hear, but you did it without any love and without any compassion? We need both. What about the workplace? My, my kids have this 
person at their work. They work at Culver's, which is kind of a hamburger place, and Custard, and two of them work at Culver's. And there's this person who's been working. She's, she's probably 60. She's been working a long time, and she's 60, and she's working with a bunch of 18-year-olds, and she hates it. <laughs> she makes it pretty clear she hates it. She lets them know she hates it. And sometimes she tells them the truth, but she is not very loving about it. I hear stories about Miss Sue about every day when they get home from work. Here's what Miss Sue said today. We can't get to that point in our workplaces where we start treating people like tools and treat them without dignity. You still have to treat people with respect, even though they sometimes do foolish things and they need to hear and be instructed. We need to work with integrity with people and in our families. I can tell you, I've been that parent who has laid out the facts with my kids. There's been a couple of times I've angry texted my kids. Have you done that? Maybe you're not that generation, but I am. But not taking the time to sit down, to reason, to wipe away their tears, to hug them when their hearts are broken. My wife's had to tell me, you know, Please don't text your criticism to the kids at school. We don't need my daughter crying in chemistry today. <laughs> I know you're ticked. I know they left all the lights on. I know the room is a mess. I know the bathroom's a mess. I know that you got to work late because they were late and, and you're frustrated, but tell them the truth, but tell them in the right situation until it was love. We need it in our hearts. We've got a couple ropes with rags in our approach with people. We will be so much more effective in communicating God's will to others, and we may see better results as soul winners as well. Does this lesson apply to you? Uh, maybe I'm just the only one, but I'll tell you, I'm not preaching it just because I want it to apply to everybody else. It applies to me. It applies to me because I've been that person one way or the other. This front row is for you. Has somebody hurt you? Is it keeping you from obeying Jesus? Friends, let me tell you, Jesus came for the bruised reeds and the smoldering wicks. He sees your value. He can use you still. And like the prodigal's father, he's longing for your return. So if you need to come home, why don't you come home tonight? Obey Jesus Christ. Turn to him. Be baptized in him if you haven't done that yet. So you can start that relationship with him living for King Jesus. If you want to do that, why don't you come this evening while we stand and while we sing.